My name is Dion. I'm a grateful recovering compulsive under earner. Hi, Hi everybody. And I'm uh, grateful to be here. And uh, just put it like that. That'll be good. Thank you. Um, and uh, that's, we, uh, Justine came out for a, uh, an East Coast um, UA meeting. It was a, it was a Saturday meeting. And uh, anyway, we were all excited and we were talking about stuff at the meeting. And you know, the vibration starts to, to r raise up in people when you, when you start to talk about under earning, recovering from under earning. And everybody gets all excited. And you know, I was, I was uh, anybody need any markers in the art? There's a phone meeting going on right now, just so you know. There are people plugged in from all over there listening to the phone Hi, meeting. So we're, we're all excited. It's about money. No, no, no. No, no, he's good. This is Calvin, everybody. Calvin's got a name tag. Now, Calvin, I want you to listen. You said you're going to listen to my talk now. All right, good. He's going to. Watch. Check it out. Listen. I'm going to tell a story about money. All right? Here it goes. We started talking about things at the meeting, and everybody gets excited. And then uh, there was, you know, somebody said, well, we ought to do this in California. Well, Justine said we ought to do this in California. And I was like, well, we need a person over there. We need a, a person on the ground over there. And uh, she said, well, I can be that person. And, and so one thing led to the other. And then other people came on and coalesced. And suddenly, you know, here we are, and we're, and we're doing this. So it's just amazing how when an idea comes up and we don't deflect that idea, you know, Things can happen, and it's not about it's not about me worrying about whether it's going to get done or not. That's the old model. The old model is I worry. I get an idea. An idea will come to me. An inspired thought will come to me, right? What if I blah, blah, blah? What if I? And then immediately I go back to the old way of thinking. I'm like, OK, the only way I've ever done anything is absolutely by myself, with no help. And any time it comes time to reach out for help, that's usually the time I abandon that skill or that job or that task. Whenever somebody has to proofread something or whenever somebody has to put in their collaborative piece or whenever it involves any other human being taking what it is that I've got going on and me having to let go just a little bit and let them do it you know, or help me, as soon as that part comes, that's when the under earner says, I'm not going to be a part of it anymore. So there's no letting go. So. Let me just talk about 23 years ago. 23 years ago, my girlfriend Amy and I were, were driving around here today. And, and I realized, like, 23 years ago, I was, uh, you know, 17. And I ran away from home in Maryland, East Coast. And I ran away from home. And I came out to California because I wanted to be an actor. I wanted to be famous. I just wanted to dominate something or just... It was old Beatles footage which really did it. That was the culprit. Because I saw like old, you know, the Beatles. I saw like, you know, Beatles footage of them being like whisked away in a darkened limousine. And there were all these girls chasing after them, right? And I was like, that's my vision. That's my vision. I'm not available to anybody, but somehow they want something from me. They love me. They pay me well. They think I'm a genius. Everything I do is great, but I can't, I don't really relate to them. That was my vision of, of happiness or abundance or prosperity or something. So I was homeless when I came out here, you know. Um, I didn't have a place to live, and I was 17, and I had quit high school, and it was here. I was on Beachwood, Gower. I was at this uh, place called a Teen Canteen. I stayed at this shelter. I was panhandling. I was doing street magic for people to, to make money for my weed that I would need before the end of the night, you know. <laughs> And it was a rough existence for eight, you know, for uh, ten months, you know, you know. What, what was that? Yeah, it was it was a rough existence, right? And uh, I got into fights, and I'm not a good fighter, <laughs> you know what I mean? So that's not cool. Um, I hitchhiked up the West Coast back then. I lost a hundred pounds because I was a compulsive eater too, and so I lost a hundred pounds on what I now call the hitchhiking and cocaine plan. <laughs> You will lose weight. <laughs> you will lose weight. But you don't see a lot of commercials for that, that particular technique, right? There's a backlash. There's a backlash to that kind of weight loss. Um, because what happened was I was skinny, right? I was slim, but I was still, the disease was still just crazy alive in me. Well, what is the disease? Who knows? I don't know. But here's some versions that the UA disease showed up for me. 
Let's go way back. That was 17 I'm talking about. I was 17 years old. Um, let's go back to uh, Maryland to this, uh, this uh, convenience store called American Mart. And uh, it was a run-of-the-mill country sort of, uh, you know, whatever. They sold, you know, porno magazines and beer and cigarettes and sundries. And uh, there was a McDonald's near it. And my family and everything, we would go to McDonald's after church stuff. And then, but I would wander over to, you know, the video games and stuff at, at American Mart. And this guy, so weird, this guy, he like, he, I helped him out. I dumped out some mop water or, or helped with something. Anyway, he gave me five bucks. Now, it could have been a, like a long-term sort of uh, setup process for him, you know, abusing me in some way. It didn't turn into that. He gave me five bucks. And I was like, okay, I did that work for him. And he gave me five bucks. And I ended up playing with it in the video machines. And I came running back to McDonald's, where my parents were, and I said, I have a job at American Mart. And they were like, what? Wow. My parents weren't really tuned into what I was doing all the time. So they didn't check things up, you know, they didn't check out the people that were giving me money. They didn't really investigate deeply into what was going on. They were just like, oh, really? Cool. So I had a job at American Mart. And a few days later, I think, I, I like wandered down there. I went down there because we... You know, I was home now, so it's a longer trip now. We're not at McDonald's. I'm going from home, walking through the other neighborhoods in the woods. And, all, and there I am at American Mart. And the guy's there, and he remembers me and everything. And I guess he gave me the five. But it was vague what the arrangement was. So I was there, and I was like, I, I, wanted, him, I wanted to do that five bucks thing again, where you give me five bucks. And I was like, remember I was hanging out before? I didn't bring this up. I'm thinking in my head, remember I hung out and I dumped something and the five bucks? Remember five bucks? And it never, and it never, and, and, and I started to feel incredible amounts of shame because I couldn't go home and tell my parents anything clear about any of it. I was just like, because I felt so embarrassed. Why? Because I had told them, I work at American Mart. And I can't tell you how many times since then I have done just that. Somebody will just start talking about an, a business idea, right? I'm like, oh, wow, that sounds great. Like, just like our idea for this, right? talk about it a little bit. And I'll go and I'll start bragging about it. Little business idea comes up. You know, you're at Starbucks, you're at a friend's house, whatever. You know what we should do? We should make corn husk dolls or whatever it is. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, we should do that. And you'll do the things and I'll do that. And then boom, we'll do it, right? Before you know it, like if you're an under earner like me, that little conversation of potentiality becomes, you start taking out loans on that. You know what I mean? You're like mortgaging your future out based on that little conversation. Oh, yeah. After the first 500,000 corn husk dolls, it was, <laughs> it was smooth sailing. So you, I advanced the thing beyond where it really is. I'm not living in reality, you know? I, I'm like the little tiny idea or the notion, I've just become a, I, 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 I uh, build a, a reputation on this thing, right? Because the words, you know? A lot of under are really good with the words, you know? We're great with spinning out the BS, you know? Um, that's why I'm up here, you know? Because now, it used to be about using. It was about use. I, I, sometimes I think that the U in UA stands for use. Because I used to use everybody and everything that came my way. And now I'm actually of use. And that's the transformation. If I had to boil it down and I only had a minute to speak, I'd say the transformation in UA is going from using everything. And the disease will use everything. It's like an octopus. We were talking about this earlier. Um, the disease is like the head of an octopus. And it will use every other addiction to keep itself going. It will use, if I'm 300 pounds overweight and I was 100 pounds overweight, it's very hard for me to show up in the world. It, I don't have any energy. My feet hurt. My body doesn't, it's, you know, you know all the, if I'm uh, stuck in my sex addiction, if I'm stuck in gambling, if I'm stuck in the drugs and the alcohol, that keeps me under earning. So under earning in and of itself doesn't really kill me. It uses the things around me to kill me, to keep me isolated. All right. I made a mind map here. This is what my mind looks like on an average day. Yeah, it's just like crowded and cluttered and Stealing. I stole. Anybody here ever stole? Don't raise your hand. <laughs> don't tell. You don't have to out yourself like that. Yeah? 
I, I've stole too, Kelvin. See, I've stolen too. I stole from my grandmother. I stole from my grandma, my auntie. So you identify. I went to the still Las Vegas. I stole from churches. I stole, you know, I'm run of the mill. I'm a run of the mill under earner, you know? Run of the mill. I stole big time. My grandmother lived in a trailer across the street from our trailer. They had a double wide. It was a little nicer. <laughs> <laughs> we were under earners. Before I continue with that story, think about this. Think about the poor kid in your school when you were in elementary school. Just call him to mind. Maybe it was you. Maybe it was somebody else. But think about him. Or her. You remember who it is. That's a result of under earning. That kid got picked on. because of the disease of compulsive underwriting. You know, I'm crying now, I don't know why, I'm not, I'm not a fanatic, you know? I don't follow Andrew, he's not a guru, you know what I mean? <laughs> it's like, you know, if you think you're here at this meeting, like, oh, and then I'm gonna get up here and go, and then Andrew touched my baby. And then, you know what I mean? <laughs> it's not that at all, it's just like, I, I just know what it is to be stuck, and then to have an answer that actually works. I know what it's like to be talented, and to be unable to render those talents. I know what it's like to have the million dollar uh, filing cabinet, I call it. And you all have your version of it, I know, if you're anything like me. The million dollar filing cabinet is the one that I you know, have had for years. And, you, and, and it's like, it's, it's given off a vibration. It's where you keep all your art or your film or your paintings or your, your ideas or your notebooks or your scratch, your know, shoebox full of just great ideas, right? And every time you come near it, you know, you pull one idea out and maybe you manage to get that idea out in the world and it takes off and you've seen evidence that it works. You've seen evidence that your ideas are good. You know that you have a thoroughbred inside you that wants to run, but you can't do anything about it. Step 11, knowledge of God's will for us and the power to carry that out. We all know we're supposed to be a light in the world. You know that. You've known that since you were singing this little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine. But I don't know how. Mr. Lauren, our minister, when I was growing up, I don't know how to let the light shine. Okay, well, what do you do? I don't know. A bunch of drunks in the 30s, a bunch, you know, they got together and they put together a book that was published the same year that The Wizard of Oz came out, which I've always found interesting. It's a big year. <laughs> no, maybe something was happening. Maybe something was happening, you know. Who knows? Theories. Who cares? What happened? These guys got together. They shared a couple of things. They're like, you know, I can't stop, and you can't stop, and let's, you know, maybe we'll talk about it, and maybe it'll help the other guy. And they go to get to help the other guy in the bed. And then they tell him, well, we can't stop, you can't stop. But they, he, he, when the guy in the bed listened to the two of them, they were like, he knows where I'm coming from. That guy gets it. I know what it's like to be talented and unable to ask for money for that talent. I know what it feels like to, to give away all of my time for free. I know what it is to be deathly afraid to say to somebody, my services cost X number of dollars per hour, and then count to 10 silently and wait. Ugh. Terrified, why? Who knows? I mean, I'll play the armchair therapist and psychologist and whatever, and I'll tell you, I think it has something to do maybe with, you know, I've got fear of abandonment and all this. No, you know what? I can actually speak, you know, very eloquently on those things, but they don't help me, like Andrew said. They don't help me. My fear, what happens is, my fear of abandonment causes me to get to the point when it's time to ask for money. Because when I ask for a clear amount of money, what happens is then the person can say to me, I don't want your services. So I never really want to get around to that point where the person can abandon me, therefore I never ask for money. Well, great, print that on a t-shirt, put it in a book, and I'm still under earning. Because <laughs> I know what it is and I can speak about it, but I can't do anything about it. Why? Because we lacked power, it says in the big book. We lacked power. Let's imagine a vacuum cleaner, okay? A vacuum cleaner has one directive, suck dirt. <laughs> That's it. That's a vacuum cleaner's job. It's written on the little job description sheet. Suck dirt. And the vacuum cleaner says, I can do that. I'm built for that. But one day, the vacuum cleaner that's the under earner 
He's like, you know what? I don't like it around here. I don't like the way things are going. If you're me, like a little kid, you know, your mom is yelling, your dad is crazy, whatever. You know, maybe it's a great household, whatever. But at some point, you make a decision. You're like, you know what? I'm not doing that. So you unplug yourself from the wall. That's what the vacuum cleaner that has the under earner's brain does. It says, you know what? Suck dirt, whatever. I'm not doing it. It unplugs and then goes, no higher power and then wonders why it can't do its prime directive. Thank you. Why can't I do my prime directive? What's my prime directive? Love others. That's mine. I don't know what yours is. It's probably slightly different from mine. Thank gosh there's a lot of us. We all have different prime directives. Mine is love others. I'm not always able to do that. Why? Because sometimes I think you're against me. Sometimes I to, you, think, you think you're trying to steal my stuff, my ideas. Sometimes I just think you look a lot like somebody who screwed me over once. You just got that look in your eye. The minute I saw you come in, I knew you couldn't be trusted. You know what I mean? So, and I, so I, I can't get along with you. That's what the under earner does. Picks people out. You gotta have an, if you're an under earner like me, you've got to have an enemy in the room. There has to be just the one person that you just don't like. But you may show me it's me. It's me. I'm the one. I'm the one that I didn't like. Yeah, you know what I mean. Okay. So how do the steps work with this? I don't know, but they do. And I'll give you a, I'm going to try to put it into words a little bit for those of you that want to do the, you know, the all-day step workshop. We're going to do this. We're going to go through it. It can't be done completely in a day. So don't even show up to the workshop thinking that you're going to have done your whole life's work in one day. You're not. But you will get a very clear example of how to do it one time through in a somewhat cursory, very specific way. Uh, specific in that it's, uh, it's, it's uh, directed very, very much toward under earners. Okay? Here's how the steps basically work. Step one. I, I, you did it. If you're here, you've already done step one. You do step one out there. Step one is done because I want to stop doing this thing. I'd like to just have enough to get by. I'd like to have enough to, you know, maybe get by and then do a little something extra, like go somewhere or buy clothes that are not torn or spend some of the $600,000 I have in the bank. That's some people's story. They got money. They can't spend it at all. Can't give it to themselves, right? So if you're here, it's step one. That's it, okay? Step two is. You know, because step one is we admitted we were powerless over under earning, that our lives had become unmanageable. The higher power wants me to have a huge life that I can't manage alone. Well, this, uh, is it coming through? Is it recording? Yeah. I think you're going to pick me up, right, Dave, if I'm over here? Yeah. Hello. Uh, you know, came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Okay, that's step two. Came to believe that a power greater than ourselves. Let's return to our little friend, the vacuum cleaner, who has unplugged himself from the wall, right? There's no higher power. He can't do his thing. The important thing is that I unplugged it at a certain point. That's the important thing. The higher power is like light that comes through the window. The only thing I do when I'm under earnings is I just pull down the shade, you know, a la Andrew's cave metaphor, which is very apt and very much applies to my life. The light, <laughs> who, who thinks that when the sun is out and I pull down a shade that the sun has gone away? That's like a, I don't know, who would be fooled by that? Maybe a parakeet or somebody. <laughs> but that's not the case. The light has never gone away. I just did something to block myself from it. Well, what did I do? What were we talking about? What did I do? And I hope you're not going to start talking to me about God. Listen, I'm not. Not God in the sense of the one that I was shown, which kind of looks a little like Barry Gibb from the Bee Gees. <laughs> He's got like feathered hair, white dude. First of all, it's a white dude. And I'm like, wait a second. Well, why, where is my God? You know, beard, feathered hair, looks a little effeminate. I don't know. <laughs> that's God, they said. You know, that's God on the wall. And I was like, I don't know. Okay. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about something, some vital energy that can help you bring your gifts out and use them to help other people rather than using other people. That's all. Simple as that, right? Step one. Step two. Came to believe 
that a power greater than ourselves, are, can you possibly believe that? If you can just possibly believe that, then you've done step two. If you can possibly believe that you were insane when you came here, that maybe it was something about the thinking, like Andrew pointed to, the sheer insanity of it. Maybe. Then you can go to step three, and step three is um, made a decision. What is a decision? A decision means that the root of it is to decide. It's like incision. Incision means what? To, to cut into. Decision means to cut something in half. When you decide, you cut one thing over here. Okay, that's the old way. And then you look at the new way. All right. I'll, I'll put that one to the side just for now. You can take your, your misery will be refunded. <laughs> you can always have it back. But if for this weekend, maybe you could just take a look possibly at this other way, make a decision. Okay, turn my will and my life over to the care of this thing. Well, how do I do? Okay, okay, I made a decision. That's all. There's this old AA thing of like, there's three frogs sitting on a log, right? One of them makes a decision to jump. How many are left? because he only made a decision. He didn't jump yet. Nothing's been done. It's just a mental position. Open-mindedness, that's all. That's all you've done by step three. You haven't bowed down to Allah or anything. People are like, God damn it, I'm not doing it because God doesn't exist. <laughs> okay, no one's asking you to do it. The only thing anybody's asking you to do is say, maybe, possibly, there's a power greater than me I haven't been able to animate my gifts to the world in any effective way. Maybe this way will help. So what then do we ask you to do? The 12 steps continue in step four, made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. We do the four-step inventory. If you're an alcoholic, under-earner, compulsive eater, recovering person like me, you know everybody that you're angry at right now. And you can give me every detail. And the face starts, you know. Oh, you should have seen what they did to me. You should have seen the way they treated me. July 29th, 1979. And I remember it. And I'm going to keep it alive. Why? Because it makes it okay when I can keep that resentment alive. It's all about resentment, okay? Resentment, the root of that is resentere. Who cares, Dion, what the root is? Because it kind of helps you understand what we're talking about. Resentment, resentere, really means to sense something again, to resense. And the big book says resentment is the number one offender. It doesn't say it's one of six good reasons why you can, should recover or why you've been suffering. It's that the number one offender, resentment. So what does that mean? Well, I've heard it put this way, you know. Um, you know, the, the NFL, I guess, when somebody tackles somebody or, you know, the guy jumps up and he catches the ball, boom, he gets hit from the side, and then they show it again and again. Boom, he gets hit from the side. Boom, he gets hit from the side. Boom, he gets hit from the side. And people love to watch it. They're just like, oh, God. Oh, did you see how he hit him? Oh, my God. Well, the thing with the under-earner's mind is you resent or resent or replay how you've been wronged. You go about, you're seizing injustices, if you're anything like me. You're seizing injustices from a young age. Oh, thank God, he just wronged me. I don't have to do any more work. I don't have to do anything. I can blame it all on that, right? And you can. Nobody's going to try to take that away from you because I couldn't take it away from you because I couldn't logically argue your well-nursed resentments away from you. I couldn't. I'm not that good. And I'm good. Believe me, my girlfriend will tell you. She always calls me a lawyer, lawyer slash teacher. When I'm getting ready to pontificate, she goes, I smell the chalk dust. I didn't think it was that funny either. <laughs> anyway, so I'm resenting, right? And you've done other things, too. If you're, if you're an under like me, you've done, oh, you've done other things, too. Um, and so there are four inventories that you take. You take the resentment inventory, then we look at, you know, how that's impacted us. Then we take the uh, sex inventory, which is like, what have we done sexually? How have we hurt other people? There's the fears inventory, which is enormous for compulsive underwriters. Enormous. I've seen it. It's almost like, now, we're just developing theories about this stuff. Whatever. It doesn't matter. I tend to think that DA, because I was in DA from 1998. I went to my first meeting. I slumped over and left at the break. I slumped over for the first half of the meeting. I couldn't take the pain that was coming up, and I left at the break and didn't come back for six months. Six minutes. Thank you. So I've been in DA. Things went well in DA, and uh, 
like I was telling Jonathan earlier, here's what happened to me in DA. I would have pressure relief meetings. A lot of you have had those, right? Where they're telling me how to organize the money, what to do with the money, how to plan the money. And I was like, but there's no the money. What do I do? What do I do about that part? You know what I mean? That's exactly it. Right, so you, you respond because you know what I'm talking about. You know what I'm talking about. So there I was. I was like, I don't know what. So I went through the fourth step, okay? Just to finish that other little unfinished line of thought, it's the uh, fears inventory, the um, resentment inventory, the harms done others, and the sex conduct. And we'll do those in the workshop, okay? Boom, that's to the side. So I started doing the step work with people in, D, in DA, right? Guy said to me, you know, you got to do this by the book. So I did it by the book, filled out all my resentments, looked at the selfishness, self-seeking, this stuff. I didn't want to see that part. My brain, your brain will start to fritter out when it comes to looking at your part of it. It'll just be like, you know, it doesn't, it does not want to, the disease does not want to see. It's like, you know what I mean? It knows it's about to be evacuated, you know? Don't. Whatever he says about our fault, don't listen. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's not true. It is true. And the disease knows that its days are numbered, you know? Okay, so the fourth step is about that. So I was doing my fourth step into the fifth step, which is when you share that fourth step, that inventory. Because we don't want to tell other people anything, you know? We don't want to tell anybody the truth because you're embarrassed. Why can't I get together? Why can't I just use more self-will? I have a master's degree, a PhD, I have this and that. No, I don't have a PhD, but others do. I have this, I have that, I have the other thing. Why can't I? And you just and, and, and you try more self-reliance. Oh, okay, I know what I'll do. This time what I'll do is I'll just screw people a little harder on the back end. Now I'll try that. That'll be you do. All the self-reliant solutions, they, they end up being this little tiny loop like this. There's no air. There's no light. There's no input. We weren't taught to get input from other people or to trust other people. Why? Let me give you a, a quick tip right now. Start getting help from imperfect people because they're the only ones you'll ever find. <laughs> That's the key right there. We're waiting for the perfect people. I went to DA and I saw them, st they were sitting there like the, uh, the, ch the Council of Elders, you know what I mean? The, the Dutch masters. I was like, all the solvent people, I was like, oh, I'm sorry, I'm not worthy. I'm sorry, please, uh, please don't hurt me. And I, Can you give me any money? I, you know what I mean? I was thinking, my God. If I just put myself down enough, maybe somebody will recognize my plight and give me some money. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. It's about this very counterintuitive route which was written out for drunks back in the 30s. And it works. Okay? I was telling my sponsor, he goes, read me that resentment. I got a resentment against my father. My father, my stepdad, adopted me. I'm biracial. My mother's, you know, she, uh, Italian lady. She's passed away. She had me with some black man. She never told me the truth. I was asked questions. Mom, who's my real dad? She's like, get out of here. <laughs> Kids in the neighborhood are like, uh, dude, you're adopted. I was the only brown kid <laughs> anywhere. I was the only brown kid. So what I'm saying that for is that there were no answers coming, no direct answers. As I was taught that you can't ask for direct answers. You can't expect this kind of stuff. Right? You all have that story. I know what it is. You, you, the people that were the higher power in the, you know, the titans of my trailer, as I call them, you know, the, the, the people that were passed out and go, go to school, and lots of money's in my purse. You know, they weren't any help. So I said, I got a resentment, sponsor. I got a resentment. I got a resentment. He goes, well, okay, what is it? I go, it's this one. My father owes me for my being, and here's where my little uh, armchair psychologist comes in. My father owes me $450,000 for my having been the emotional husband to my mother. <laughs> my sponsor's like, what? <laughs> my father owes me $450,000 for the emotional blah, blah, blah. And he said, okay, okay, I got you. I got you. <laughs> Let me ask you a question. I said, all right, what? Because I'm ready. You know, I got my resentments. They're like, they're all argued and they're ready. You know, it's like a court, my day in court. Don't try it. <laughs> He goes, let me just ask you a question, that's all. I said, okay, what? He said, he said, do you think he's coming with that money? <laughs> like, fuck. I was like, wow. 
why? What? No. He was like, all right. I had been waiting for those that owed me the money. You can have it as long as you want. As long as you want to tell me why and who you're blaming and all that, you can keep it. And now I realize, keep it. And keep it far away because it doesn't help you. I thought Ed McMahon and the prize patrol and my father were going to come to my door with an oversized check. And in the memo box, it was going to be for your having been the emotional husband to your mother when I wasn't there. They didn't come. And when I realized that, this was in 2004 when I did the 12 steps in DA. And when I realized that, I was like, okay, wait a second. I got to just let go of this thing because it's crazy, the thinking. That was dry. Because what I was doing is I was sitting in, waiting. I was sitting in my apartment, almost literally waiting for the money. <laughs> and my life became a demonstration of poverty until those that had wronged me recognized what they had done and came with the check. <laughs> so my, I can't show up in court looking healthy and looking nice with clothes and everything. You've got to be a demonstration of poverty because they're not going to know that he owes you that money. So when he uncovered that for me, I was like, oh, God, okay, good. So dad never came with the prize patrol, but what happened was turning that over and then moving through the rest of the steps, we'll talk about this tomorrow. Um, what happened was I had made $15,000 up till that point. This is 2004. The next year, the very next year, I made $53,000 in 25 days. And I was like, this thing is loaded, <laughs> this wand or whatever. I didn't, but I went right back into the under earning because I was terrified of that power. I was like, this is all me because I was still coming from an ego place. I was like, this is all me. I, and, I was, and I ran, I ran high. So 2005, 2006, until three years ago when I came into UA, and I was like, okay, good. Someone has named that thing that I do when I do make a lot of money real quick and get terrified of it and go running. And it hasn't been that way since. I don't, I, I still, now I make good money, better money than ever before, but I don't run from it when it's happening. I've learned to just stay with the uncomfortability and, and, and sit at that vibration. And it's that same vibration that happens when I'm talking to you. When I look at you and I greet you and I want to run, I'm like, what does he want from me? And what is he thinking? And does he like me? And is it okay, good, here, okay, good. It's that same vibration of human interaction. You know what I mean? I'll finish with this. Money is proof that you've been around people. All the money you got right now in your pocket came from somebody. Came from a job, came from here. You found it on the street, maybe. Okay, but we don't find regular income on the street. But it's proof of your relationships. And so the steps go on to help restore and rebuild those relationships. And we got to do that first. You can't lose sight. This is not a get-rich-quick weekend seminar with Tony Robbins. It's a 12-step get-together. It's about the higher power. Don't worry about the money. Worry about getting your shit straightened because under-earners can be some of the hardest people to work with that I've ever met, but I love them because they're just like me. They're contentious. They know it all. They want to fight you. They want to punch you and scratch you until they remember that they want to really love you. And then they go, oh, that's right. That's really what I was. Okay, so good. Hope you got something out of that. I hope I helped. Thank you. Thank you.